I noticed that on the internet, there's a lot of questions about science, and I've seen people trying to answer them, and they're doing a good job, but the answers they're putting sometimes are difficult to follow, sometimes they are too shallow. So I figure, I used to be a science teacher, so let me try to set up a few videos to explain some topics that I keep seeing on the internet. And the first topic I want to look at is the expansion of the universe. The lead current, current belief is that it's accelerating, but I can actually prove that it's moving at a constant velocity. So let's do that. I like to go back in history when I explain something. And one of the main concepts in physics and science is motion. So if you go back a number of years, people looked at the Earth, and apart from the occasional earthquake and wind and so forth, the Earth seemed to be stationary. And it was a steady, unchangeable, unchanging environment. And they look at the sky, it was pretty much the same thing. Stars seemed to go around the Earth yearly, and it kind of proved to humans that we were the center of the universe. To explain how the stars moved around the Earth, they came up with the idea that the Earth was enveloped inside of a bunch of shells, spheres. There was the biggest one, the sphere that contained all the stars, and that went around the Earth once a year. And there was another shell, another sphere that the sun was stuck onto, and it went around the Earth once a day, and the moon went around 20, once every 28 days and so forth. So it seemed to make sense. The problem was that some stars didn't follow a totally circular pattern. Some of them wandered around the sky. And the idea of spheres couldn't really explain this motion. Okay, so they tried creating wheels inside wheels and spheres inside spheres. Because let's say, take, take a look at Mars, it comes in what seems to be a, a pattern, a, a circular pattern, but then it stops and goes back. And then it stops again and keeps going. So as more planets came into view, this, pr this problem of stars not doing what they're supposed to be doing became impossible to, to, uh, to explain. In a way, we have the same problem today. It's with dimensions. In the old days, we believed there were three dimensions, top and bottom, top and down, left to right, front and back. And then Einstein came up and he explained time as being a fourth dimension. And it seemed to work. But then scientists look at the concept and said, wait a second, why not make it six or seven dimensions? How about eight or nine dimensions? How about going to 11 dimensions to try to explain how the universe works? And there is even, I believe, there's a, a theory right now called string theory that uses something like 26 dimensions. So dimensions, uh, surges, uh, spheres, uh, it's kind of like one and the other. It's just, we don't understand what's going on. Well, Copernicus, Copernicus look at the problem here, and they say, you know what? It would make life a lot easier if the sun was the center of the universe, not the earth. But it was just a theory, an hypothesis. It wasn't, nobody really bothered with it. Until this guy named Galileo Galilei, he was a poor boy from a poor family. And he had, he got himself a uh, small telescope, like five to 10 powers. And he looked at Jupiter. And when he looked at Jupiter, he realized there were four dots going around Jupiter. And he knew the moon went around the Earth. Therefore, he figures those must be moons of Jupiter. Then he turned the telescope to Venus. And when he looked at Venus, he saw faces of Venus, just like we have faces of the moon. So based on that information, he figures 
the sun is the center of the universe, not the earth. Well, it's all good and fine, except for one little problem. The powers to be didn't care for people moving the earth from the center of the universe. And they threatened to cremate him alive. They had done it to, to Giovanni Bruno before, so he figures it's not safe to insist on the sun being the center of the universe. So he recanted and went on to his merry life. But once the idea is out there, it's very hard to put it back into the box. So Kepler came up and he came up with some ideas, some mathematics proving that the sun was the center of the earth, not the, uni the earth, the center of the universe, not the earth. And they couldn't very really well argue with his numbers. But even though the, the earth was moved from the center to the periphery, the universe was pretty much static and changing as always. By the early 1900s, astronomers were starting to notice that the universe was not standing still. The universe was expanding. And if the universe is expanding, you can run it backwards to see what would happen. And if you did that, you kind of think, came up to an idea that maybe in the beginning, there was an explosion that created the universe. But that was difficult to accept. So it was pretty much even Einstein kind of agreed that the universe was static. But as it went on and on, proved the observation that the universe was expanding, kept increasing. So to uh, avoid the problem of a beginning of the universe, scientists came up with the idea of a steady state theory, in which case, which meant that the universe was expanding. But what happened as it expanded, new matter was being created between galaxies. And this matter formed into stars and eventually became galaxies, which kept moving. So yes, the universe is expanding, but it's pretty much staying the same. And to disparage the idea of a universe being born in one spot, they called it the Big Bang Theory. And that, I don't mean the Big Bang Theory to show, but the idea that the universe started as, as a huge explosion that created space and time and matter and energy and everything. Well, going into the 60s now, two scientists, Francis and Wilson, they were working with the Bell Lab and trying to do some research in microwave transmission, basically, it's a business. And they built this horn antenna. And the problem was, when they pointed the antenna to the sky, no matter which way they pointed it, they kept getting a background noise, a background radiation. It seems to be everywhere. It was cosmic. Now they knew somebody had written a paper saying if there was a big bang, if there was an origin to the universe, then there should be some leftover, meaning there should be some radiation in the universe at this point. And that radiation they were measuring was exactly what was predicted. So based on this, the big bang probably turned to be the best explanation for the beginning of the universe. The problem was a thing called gravity. If the universe is expanding, what's gravity doing? Is it slowing it down? Is it, what's it doing exactly? So these two teams of scientists tried to figure out is gravity slowing down the universe or not? And they did some fantastic work. And in 2011, they received the Nobel Prize for discovering that the universe not only is expanding, but the expansion is accelerating. Well, they used two concepts to come up with a conclusion. Number one is called the inverse square law. And the second one is Doppler effect, Doppler shift. Now these are common knowledge, high school level concepts. 
The inverse square law basically says the in intensity of radiation is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. And what it means is this. If you have a source of, sort of light, or it could be sound, doesn't matter what, you have a source of energy. If you measure how much energy goes through a square, let's say, that's a certain distance from here, you measure a certain amount of energy going through it. If you double the distance, the amount of energy that goes through an area that's four times as big is the same as the amount of energy, area of light energy going through one small square. And if you double it again, it would be 16 one times the area. So the further you go, basically, the, the less intense the energy seems to be. And the closer you are, the more intense it is. So knowing the brightness of a source and measuring what it looks like with apparent brightness, you can figure out how far you are from the source of light. The second one is called the Doppler shift. And it's a change in waves noticed whenever there's relative motion between source and observer. In other words, if you have a, an ambulance with a siren coming toward you, what happens is the motion between the, the siren and the, the, the ambulance and you, it's, it's shrinking the waves, making them a higher frequency. So if you listen carefully enough, you will see, you will hear a higher frequency. Meanwhile, if somebody is standing away from the ambulance, the waves seem to be stretched out. So you hear a lower frequency. And it doesn't matter if it's the source that's moving or the observer that's moving. As long as there's relative motion between the two of them, you'll hear the difference. So whenever a wave source moves, toward an observer, the waves get compressed. And whenever a wave source moves away from a, an observer, the wave gets stretched. So by measuring the change in wavelength or frequency, we can figure out how fast something is moving and if it's moving toward you or away from you. Well, it turns out there's supernovas out there and that's what's called the type 1a supernova. And this type of supernova, for some reasons, always reach the same maximum brightness. So by measuring how bright they are, as compared to the actual brightness, we know how far they are. And by measuring the Doppler shift, we can tell if they're moving away from us or toward us and how fast. So when they did that, they graphed it and they came up with this graph like this. If you notice the graph, it seems to have an upward curve, which means stars, supernovas are moving away from us at an accelerating rate. They're moving faster and faster. The further you are off, the faster they seem to move. So they got a Nobel Prize for figuring out that the universe is expanding at an accelerated rate. There are two problems with this conclusion. Number one, objects can only be accelerated by a force, and that's Newton's idea, F equals ma. The force is that gives an acceleration to a mass. So when scientists realized that the universe is expanding, then there must have been a force causing the expansion. But we don't know what it was. And in science, an unknown is called the dark. So they had to come up with the dark force, which was not a good way to phrase it. So instead of calling it dark force, they called it dark energy. And we're looking for it, but we can't find it. The second one, and this is a major problem with scientists. Scientists based their conclusion, these scientists based their conclusion on one state of data. Yes, they could have found more supernovas, but they would end up just putting more dots on the same graph. And the problem with this is the science requires data to be validated, to be reproduced. And that's impossible to do in a situation here. Because I'm 
things that can be done. So what I did, I created my own universe, which is basically one meter of knit aluminum, a, a knit elastic that's bolted down to a table on one end with a clamp. And every 10 centimeters, very hard to see, but every 10 centimeter, I put a dot and each dot represents a galaxy or a supernova, whatever. All right, so now I have a choice. I can expand it at an accelerated rate or I can use a constant velocity rate. And to make life easy for myself, I decide to expand my universe by 10 centimeters every second, which is a constant expansion rate. So every second, I measure the distance that each dot moves from the origin. And by subtracting the new length from the old one, I know how much my universe expanded in one second. And since I have distance and time, I can find the velocity, because velocity is equal distance divided by time. When I did that, after one second, this is what happened. The 10 centimeter dot moved 11.2 centimeters, which means it moved 1.2 centimeters away. Since it was in one second, it had a velocity of 1.2 centimeters per second. The dot that was 20 centimeters away moved to 22.2 centimeter, which, at this, which is a distance of 2.2 centimeters in one second which gives me a velocity of 2.2 centimeters per second. The data was at 30 centimeters, moved to 33.3 centimeters. You get the idea. So when I look at this table now, it seems that the further I go, the faster these dots are moving, which is what they were finding at the Yellow Bell Prize for it. So, what I did, I graphed it. And when I graphed it, I didn't get the upward curve. I got a straight line. And a straight line means a constant velocity. Okay? So now, here's the problem. I did this here for five seconds. And I took measurements. So the first second, it moved to 11.2, the second second at 12.5, third second at 13.5, 14 sec four seconds later, 14.6, and so forth. Now, if I had gone on to about 10 seconds, eventually my last point would have been about 20 centimeters away, which you figure now it brings you to this point here. Well, now I've worked the distance, the velocity factor in. So the first 10 centimeter dot moved the velocity 1.2, two seconds later it was 1.2, three seconds later 1.2, four seconds later 1.1. So basically it was a constant velocity for each dot. But again, when you get to the 10th dot, you are 20 centimeters away but the velocity will still be 1.2 or thereabout, not 2.2. This is what I'm talking about. So, if astronomers could repeat the same measurements over extended time lapse, meaning hundreds of millions of years, the acceleration will probably be revealed as a constant velocity. It wouldn't be acceleration anymore. Now, if you have a constant velocity, then you don't need a dark energy anymore. And what could have caused that constant velocity? Well, that was probably the result of the Big Bang and whatever followed afterwards. We're going to go into it later. So, how fast is the universe expanding? Well, the answer is the speed of light. Of course, before I can prove this, we have to agree that our place and time in the universe is not 
special. It's standard. It's the same as the older standard. All right. There's no special frame of reference that we have. So now I'm going to prove that the universe is expanding at a constant rate. So if it is, I can set up a ratio between any two points in the universe. And for, to do this, I'm going to use the Hubble constant, which is how fast the universe is expanding every so often. And I'm going to make my first point one megaparsecs away, which is about 3.26 times 10 to the 6 light years away. At that distance, the universe is expanding at about 69 to 71 kilometers per second. I'm going to keep it at 70 kilometers per second just to make it easier for myself. So that's my first point. It's going to be this far, this speed. My second point, I'm going to select the edge of the visible universe, which is 13.8 times 10 to the 9 light years away. The question is, what is the universe velocity at that point? Well, very simple ratio. Velocity divided by distance, it's equal to velocity divided by distance. This is my first point, and this is my edge of the universe. And if you work the numbers out, you find that the velocity of the universe, at the edge of the universe, is basically the speed of light. So the universe is expanding at the speed of light. So the universe is expanding at the speed of light. Or conversely, what we call the speed of light, that's just the expansion of the universe. A different universe may have a different speed of light if such a thing does exist. Okay. So the question that becomes, why can't we go faster than the speed of light? If the speed of light is just how fast the universe is expanding, why can't we go faster than that? I mean, the speed of sound is whatever it is, but we can't go faster than the speed of sound, although very few items, natural objects, can actually go faster than the speed of light, of sound. But we can go faster than the speed of sound. Why can't we go faster than the speed of light? That's a different problem. I understand that the motion of the galaxy points to universal expansion. The expansion of the universe has nothing to do with the galaxies, how uh, they behave. And even though I'm assuming the universe has a radius of 13.8 times 10 to the 9 light years, I'm aware that by now it's bigger than that. So the question becomes now, what is space if it can expand? And that's my next video. If you follow this presentation to its logical conclusion, you realize that scientists are locked in a conundrum. You see, some scientists are intent on determining exactly what dark energy is, where it is, what's it doing. While other scientists are struggling to pinpoint the exact value of the Hubble constant. The problem is this. Dark energy assumes that the expansion, the universe is expanding at an accelerated rate, while the Hubble constant assumes that the universe expansion is proceeding at a constant velocity. Well, this expansion cannot have a constant velocity and acceleration simultaneously. And in my presentation, I proved that universe expanding at a constant velocity, and the velocity is the speed of light. Now I'm going to make a new video in which I'm going to discuss space or space-time, what it is and is it uniform or is there difference between from place to place 